Right, good morning everyone. My name is Benny Swart. I am uh, one of the guys from Cape Town, as you can see. I always use this picture no, ma uh, no matter the location, um, because Cape Town is a beautiful city. Today I'll be speaking to you about tips and tricks, how to speed up Postgres when you are doing automated testing. This is sort of a continuation from a talk I gave last year, this one at the bottom. Uh, which discussed how we automated deployment and testing with Docker. So we'll start somewhere around the end of that talk, just to recap, and then we'll get, uh, get into the meat and bones of this one. Um, there's also a row level security, if that's your type of thing, which I gave last year, which you can have a look at. So we'll start um, a bit in the middle, and um, this doesn't really have a good introduction, we're just going to get going. but. We need to understand, when you're doing automated testing, we need to understand the importance of isolating your tests. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, we'll get into it in a bit. So we'll look at why is it so important to isolate your tests, and how can we, can we go about uh, doing that. And then we'll just recap um, on an overview of how we currently do our automated testing. And then in, in the second part, we're going to look at how can we tune the Postgres config um, to, to optimize it for when we're doing uh, tests. And then finally, how can we use RAM uh, instead of disks to gain additional uh, performance? And then some questions at the end. So what you can see happening here is a screen record of our automated testing. So our application is web-based, and this is just um, programmatically clicking through our application. And the stack that's in use here is right at the end there. We have the spec file. That's the, the programmatic definition of your test. We use Mocha.js and WebDriver IO to power the test. That drives Selenium, which drives a Chrome instance. And then it connects to our Python backend with the um, Postgres database right at the bottom. So isolating tests. Why is it important? Well, if you... Um, have your test nicely organized. You probably have it grouped by some criteria. You group it by feature, or you group it by workflow, or whatever. It doesn't really matter as long as it's organized somehow. But when you have only one database, how do you run consecutive tests? So let's say you have 10 um, files that you have to run. You init your database, you start your backend, and now you run those files one by one. The first file running will um, see the database, state, uh, the database state as clean. So it's going to be as you, as you um, inited it at the start. But any consecutive tests will see the changes that the previous tests have made. And if any of your prior tests have left the database in an unexpected state, this might cause all of the following tests to fail. So for example, Let's say in your first test, you post an invoice for 500 Rand. Then you have an, a, a check. You see, is the account balance outstanding equal to 500 Rand? Yes. Then you post a receipt for 400 Rand. You check, is the balance outstanding 100 Rand? Yes. OK, and now test two executes. You post an invoice for 1,000 Rand. You check, is the balance outstanding 1,000 Rand? No. Because you still have 100 Rand left from the, from the first test. So that is why. It's important to isolate your test. Um, many of you should have uh, run across this already. Um, and you can think of a myriad of other scenarios where, where this um, will have to be done in order to run your test properly. So how do we go about doing that? Well, one option, which I've seen someone present um, about in previous years, is to run or to wrap each test in a separate transaction. Now, that sounds nice and elegant. And it, it would look something like this. You, you use one connection to do your tests on. You begin the transaction, you run all of the tests, and you roll back, and your database is clean again. It sounds simple enough, but as you can imagine, this may require significant changes or hacks to your existing code base. Um, I know when I saw this, I thought, wow, that's neat. It'll never work for us. And it didn't. Um, and then there's the fact that not everything in Postgres can be rolled back or done transactionally. And even if it could, sometimes transactions just won't work. For example, if you make use of listen notify, 
Um, Notify actually requires you to commit before it emits. And another example is if you have two processes working on the same data. So let's say from your um, website, somebody commits data into your database, and then you have a worker process in the background that needs to read that data. The first process needs to commit that data for the second process to see it. So in, in such cases, you, you can't isolate everything in a transaction. Another idea, and this is what we use, is to just create a separate DB for each test. So you would start at the beginning of your, your test file, of each test file. You create a DB, you run all your tests, and then you drop it. This requires no changes to existing code. And there's no caveats. Everything works as usual and as you expect it. But it's slow, as you can imagine. But it doesn't have to be if you do it right. And that's what this talk is about, doing things right and speeding it up. So let's see how we do it. Um, just some, some key points to start with. All of our tests are functional tests using Selenium. So as you saw in the beginning, functional tests mean, um, just means it's at the highest possible level. So we're just clicking around. Um, we're not testing each individual component separately. Ideally, we should, but we, we don't have the manpower to do that currently. Um, the thinking behind this is, is if you can click a lot of stuff in the browser and you see the correct results, then a lot of stuff is probably working. It's simple, but it, 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 work. it works. It's sufficient. Remember, the purpose of automated testing is not to ensure that your code works. You know it works when you merge it. It's to ensure that your code does not break. And that's a very key uh, distinction. Then all of our tests run in isolation. We create a clean DB for each uh, spec file. And our database size clean, we are working on this, but currently clean database is 1.2 gig. And we create a separate database and backend for each test. Otherwise, test A would do something that breaks test B, as we've seen. 1.2 gig is a pretty large DB to init, but we'll show how we manage this effectively. All of our tests run in parallel, as much as, you, as we can do on the, on the hardware. And we are, allowed to, we, we are able to do this because our tests are isolated. And this also allows better uh, utilization of resources. And then finally, our tests run inside of a container. And we use Docker for this. Now, if you're not familiar with Docker, and we're not going to go into it so much, but you can just think of it this way. Docker is a way to package all your stuff. So you can think of it as a virtual machine in that it's a self-contained environment, and that environment is isolated from the host. But it uses a lot less resources, so less CPU, less RAM, and it starts up a lot faster. So if you don't know Docker, just think of it. It's a VM, but it's really lightweight, and it starts up really fast. Don't crucify me for that, the guys that do know Docker. OK, so how we do it, how we run our tests, well, how we used to do it, and then quickly ran into problems. I'll take you through the evolution. Right at the bottom, we have this uh, Postgres database, and we have our Python backend on top of that. Then, uh, then we connect to it using Chrome. Now, we, we're quite privileged in the sense that we create a Chrome app. That's our thing. So our website is made for Chrome. Um, our clients are specific. It's not open to the entire world. So we can get away with, with a couple of shortcuts there. Not that it's too relevant, but it's just background. Selenium powers Chrome, uh, Mocha and WebDriver to run our test in the testing framework, and then we execute the spec files one by one. So that's what we used to do when we did it the first time. That's how it looked. But the problem with this is to spin up that DB in at 1.2 gig uh, takes a while, anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes back in the day. We had no isolation between tests, and we also couldn't do parallel tests. Because even if your first test passes, it might go through an invalid state and back to a valid state. And if you have another test starting at the time of the invalid state, it'll break in any case. So our tests were in series at the start. And then we run all of this inside of a Docker container just to um, ease the setting up and tearing down. So the first question we ask is, how can we get rid of that 10 to 20 minute inner time of the database? And what we came up with is we said we're going to run the database in a container as well. This allowed us to set up and init the database only once, commit that as a Docker image, 
and then that new clean database can be started as a Docker container almost instantly. Multiple simultaneous clean databases, in fact, almost instantly. And cleanup is as simple as killing and removing the container. The reason you can get away with doing this in testing is because your data only needs to persist for the duration of the test. So if you lose your data in your test, or if the test executes successfully, nobody cares about what happens to the data. You can throw it all away. The first thing we did was to take the DB out of the main test container, put it in its own container. And that took care of the problem where the database setup takes a long time. So here, this alone, we cut 20 minutes of our test runs. Easy. Uh, depending on your case, it might be less, might be more. The second problem is how do, we, how do we isolate our tests? And as I've already said, what we decided on is we're just going to start a new browser, a new backend, and a new database for each test. The trick is how to do this effectively and quickly. So before, when our tests were about to start, we would start up a database and backend for that test on, let's say, localhost port 8000. We would point the tests to localhost port 8000, and we would start running them. Okay, easy enough. Afterwards, it looked like this. When we start running a test file, we introduced what we call the isolator. So now the isolator runs on port 8000 instead of the database directly. And before that individual spec file, before each individual spec file starts execu executing, we quickly do an HTTP GET to the isolator on, let's say, slash start, whatever the endpoint you choose. The isolator then receives that request and on demand starts up a new backend and database pair on another port, let's say port 8001. And then it responds to that initial request with an HTTP redirect to port 8001. And the tests start running um, on the backend that's on 8001. And when the next spec file starts, we did that again, 8002. And another one, and so on. And I remember those databases are already clean inside of a Docker image. So starting that up, depending on all the work you do on init, it's, we, we're talking seconds um, for, for 1.2 gig clean database. So that, oh, right. So we introduced the isolator into our setup there. And that, that takes care of the, um, the isolation between tests. And, and it does, does so really quickly. And now, be, because we have isolation, we can also run parallel tests. And so that solves that problem. And so this is more or less how our test setup looks today. We can run as many tests in parallel as the server can handle. Each test is completely isolated from the one running next to it, running before it, and running after it. Yeah, so this is how we do it now. So in summary, the final setup is quite elaborate with a lot of interconnecting pieces, but it works and it works well. We've been using that exact setup for a couple of years now. And there's something to say for doing it right. When you are building your automated testing framework, you, we, one of the two things, well, two of the things you really, really want to do from the beginning is you want to isolate your test and you want the test to run in parallel. Or you want a lot of time. So you might have noticed that the isolator is running inside of the main test container, but it's also responsible for starting up new backends and new uh, containers containing the database. So how is it able to do that being inside of a container itself. And if you're thinking Docker inside, inside of Docker at this stage, you're completely wrong, or you just have a large colonies to do that, larger than I had at the time. Uh, the easiest way is actually to just mount the Docker socket inside of the container, the, your main test container. And this allows that test container to control the Docker daemon on the host. So a lot easier to do it this way. And the optimizations we've seen here is we, we are able to create multiple clean, relatively large databases almost instantly. And another optimization you can do here, and what we do, 
is we actually have that isolator pre-allocate a pool of backend database pairs after the initial pairs have been started up. So let's say you start, you, you have uh, three tests running simultaneously. So it, those three uh, hit the isolator, it starts up three pairs, but it also starts up, let's say, three more in a pool. And when the fourth test starts, it gets a database that's an, a database in the back end instantly, as in not almost instantly this time, instantly. So that shaves another couple of seconds off of every test run or every spec file. Okay, so now we get into the, the new stuff. And now that we have that opt optimized setup, how do we optimize Postgres? So I'll, be, I'll mention the settings briefly here um, and discuss them briefly, but we're not going to go into too much detail. Um, I want you to just remember the, the concepts and sort of make a mental note of the setting that you need to go and look at. And then if you're not familiar with it, you, you can um, go and consult the docs later. Some background on our environment. We have a test server with 64 cores, 128 gigabytes of RAM and an SSD. We run a maximum of 16 concurrent spec files on that and two concurrent tests. So, so that gives you at any time at most 32 Chrome instances, 32 backend instances, and 32 instances of Postgres. And the longest spec file runs for about five minutes, just to give you some idea of what we're dealing with. So the values I'm going to list here is those that happen to work for us. Obviously, if your setup differs, you can tune them differently for you. But just make a mental note of, of what it is you need to look at. Right, so low-hanging fruit, obviously. If you are only going to run that database for five minutes max, in our case, you don't need to do any database maintenance. That's just going to waste time, waste RAM, waste disk IO, waste CPU. So auto vacuum, turn that thing completely off. You don't need that. Then disable checkpoints. So what a checkpoint does is it flushes all of your wall data into the underlying data files um, so that in normal use of Postgres, you, if your, um, your Postmaster goes down, you can restore from the checkpoint more quickly. You don't have to replay as much of the wall. You start from your checkpoint, you start from the checkpoint and replay only the, the latest wall. But obviously, we're going to run this for five minutes. We're not going to be restarting Postgres. And if it does crash, we're not going to do all that trouble to get it back up. We're just going to restart the test. So we also don't need checkpointing. So the settings relevant here is we increase the wall size to something large. We're also not going to be doing as much um, Postgres transactions in, in five minutes. So that thing really won't grow up to 10 gig ever. Um, set your checkpoint completion target to 90% of that. It's rather arbitrary. It doesn't really matter. And just suspend your checkpoint timeout as much as possible. So if your test runs for five minutes, you'll basically never checkpoint. That's the point here. Then you want to minimize your wall activity. Um, reducing the number of wall flashes to disk reduces your disk IO, obviously. The settings here you want to look at is first off, F-Sync, turn that off. Uh, what F-Sync does is it ensures that when you execute a query that updates the database, that um, update is recorded in the wall file. It ensures that that's done, so it flashes to disk every single time. But because we don't care about the data in a test, we don't care about resilience of data in a test, we don't need that, so turn that off. You can also turn off synchronous commit. So usually, if you execute commit, um, Postgres will wait for that data to flush to the wall file before commit returns. We don't need that in a test. We don't really care if the data goes to the wall file at all. And then those two settings, will write a delay, will write a flush after, what that basically does is you just delay wall flashes as long as possible to group writes together and increase write efficiency. Ideally, what you would want to do is turn the wall off. That's really what we're trying to do, but I couldn't find a way to make Postgres do it. Maybe I just missed it, if that's possible. Uh, tell us afterwards. But you, if you can't turn it off, just suspend it as long as possible. And then finally, turn off full page writes. So what that does is when Postgres makes the first change to a page of data, it flushes that entire page to the wall for resilience reasons. But once again, we don't care about that, so, so turn that off. And then obviously, allocate resources generously. Um, so turn, turn your work mem up to as much as you can afford, really. Um, 
if there's anything else, please make a note, share it afterwards. I have to um, say that I'm not a Postgres admin, uh, or I'm not a DBA, so I don't tune these things on a daily basis. That's not my job, I'm a developer. And secondly, these settings were tuned for our database, which, which runs 9.6 still. So there might be things um, that, that came in that, that can really help that I'm not aware of. I did scan quickly, but I, I didn't really find anything um, else. So let's look at how we can use RAM to speed things up even more. Now, another quick word about Docker is Docker uses a layered file system. A Docker image consists of read-only layers. So let's say the part at the bottom there is a Docker image. All of those layers are read-only. And then there's a thin read-write layer right at the top, and that's the image plus that final layer is your container, basically. That's the thing that runs. Um, and the, the top layer uses a copy-on-write strategy. Um, so what that means is if you change a single byte in any of the files in the underlying layers, that entire file is copied up to the read-write layer um, in, in, its, in its whole. So the whole new file is stored up there. And then you basically look, you look down through that to see your, your file system. But this actually makes the wall really inefficient. Usually wall is efficient, efficient because it's append only. But in a, in a container, appending one byte results in copying that entire thing to the top layer. So wall is good, Docker is good, Docker and wall, not so good. Ideally in that setup, what we would want is we would want that entire top layer to be completely in memory and not right out to disk because all of it is temporary. We're doing tests, we don't care about the data. But unfortunately, that's not supported by Docker yet out of the box. But we can do this ourselves using OverlayFS. So how OverlayFS, how many of you are familiar with OverlayFS? A couple of fans. Um, it's, it's, Docker actually uses OverlayFS. It's one of its uh, storage file system it, it can use. So in concept, OverlayFS uses uh, three things, a lower directory, an upper directory, and then an overlay directory or a merge directory. So in the image here, you can see the, the lower plane as the read-write Docker image, which is the lower directory, and it's read, uh, the, the read-only Docker image, sorry. It's read-only. The upper directory you can see as the top layer that's read-write of your container. And then the overlay is just an abstraction of the two. When you look at the overlay, you see um, the file system looking down, basically. I hope that makes sense. So for Postgres, what we can do is we can make file Postgres SQL the lower directory, which is read-only, and then we can make some directory in RAM and make that our upper directory and then create a mount point using overlayFS that looks down through the RAM directory and then sees your Postgres at the bottom. So any changes you make to the things at the bottom are going to be written into RAM instead. So as I've said, any writes in this case to your overlay directory to part to mount location, which is actually uh, PostgreSQL at the bottom, is now copied directly into RAM instead of disk. Um, once again, just take note of the concept, but we'll, we'll look at an, an example of how you can actually achieve this. So let's start by creating three directories. We create the upper directory, the merge directory, and the work directory. The work directory is, is um, Implementation specific, let's, we say to, uh, let's say to overlay FS. So it's not um, essential to understand the concept. So if you're interested, you can look at that later. Create the mount. So mount type overlay. Set your lower directory. Let me use this thing. Lower directory to varlib PostgreSQL. Your upper directory to this um, directory you created in RAM. I should say that we created it in the shared memory device. So that's in RAM. Uh, your work directory for this doesn't matter, and you mount that thing in your merge directory. And then you start Postgres on that. So execute as Postgres, start it, and point the, the I assume that stands for data directory or whatever, point that to this location 
in your merge directory. That's how you can achieve this one way. But how much does this actually help? Well, I took a look on our server, and when we are running a test with 16 concurrent spec files, before we did this, we run an entire test, and during that test, we write 43 gigabytes to disk. That's just Postgres doing its thing. Nothing special, really, at a rate of 110 megabytes per second. And that really is not something that's acceptable. But after we did this, just writing to RAM instead of disk came down to a rate of two, oh, well, just over three megabytes per second. So an enormous improvement, so over 34 times. Um, in fact, before we did this RAM disk, the reason we had to look deeper into this is because our test would constantly time out and fail because the disk was just too digested. We couldn't do 16 concurrent spec files. We had to reduce it. But then we had idle CPU. <laughs> Thanks. So an enormous improvement just by using RAM. You can even mount a RAM disk over your entire file system, not just uh, one target directory if you choose. But uh, once again, remember the idea, remember the concept. You might need to rebind some special paths and copy a couple of special files. So just an example, we create the three directories again, create the mount, but this time the lower directory is the root of your file system. And you need to remount proc in there, also remount sys, dev, run, you might need to remount some other stuff as well, depending on what you use inside of there. And then, in our case, we, we had to copy the hosts file and resolve.conf over as well. And then you use groot to change your effective root to that mount directory that's in RAM. And then you can actually just start Postgres normally, because the default directory is going to check, even though it's, it's the actual path is dev shm virtual merge varle postgres that whole thing uh, where is it now that whole thing becomes your effective root when you execute this so some notes we also found that in our test docker chrome tended to write to slash temp a lot and if you run 32 chrome instances they write even more so the same solutions we've already mentioned will uh, mentioned will work for this problem as well you can mount a RAM disk over slash temp, or you can mount a RAM disk over everything. But there's an easier solution in this case because you, don't, you, you probably don't want to um, maintain the initial data in slash temp. So um, Docker has a, a built-in flag that you can just mount a temporary file system at that location. So just use dash dash tempfs when uh, running the container, much easier. When you're going to use this much RAM, you might also need to increase the size of the shared memory for your containers. There's a flag for that as well in Docker. Uh, if you're going to be modifying mounts inside of a container, that container needs to be privileged. And as I've already said, you can mount the Docker socket inside of a container to allow that container to manipulate the host Docker daemon and start new containers. And in summary, Running Postgres in a container allows us to start up multiple simultaneous clean databases almost instantly. Then we tune the Postgres config to disable anything that you don't need in your tests, such as uh, things related to maintenance, resilience, etc. Essentially, you break all the rules here. You disregard any best practices. Anything that Postgres, the, the devs spent years on developing to guarantee resilience, you just chuck it out the window because you don't care about the data persisting after the test or in case of a crash. And then finally, minimize your disk IO. Um, and if you can't turn it off, just force it into RAM instead of disk. This works for other applications as well, not just Postgres, as we've seen with, with Chrome. OK, and that's it. Thanks. I think we finished a bit early. I didn't get my five-minute warning yet. Um, so there's some time for questions. If you have a question, raise your hand and wait for the mic.
Don't tell me none of you do automated tests. This one, yeah. Actually, before you start, let me just say that automated testing has been the uh, chief contributing factor to stabiliz stabilizing our releases, even though we're not completely there yet. Um, saving time of the developers in testing. It's just, there's a curve, there's an investment that you need to do initially to get your test going, but once you have that, the benefits are, are amazing. So definitely look into it if you don't have it yet, definitely. Uh, I just wanna know, um, in the beginning you said your database is about 1.2 gig in size. Um, let's say you make a new release and there's a quite a couple of database changes required. Can you take us through the procedure to upgrade all these Docker instances with a new database? Because I believe it's not only your, your config files, but uh, how do you replicate them through your test packages and stuff as well? Yes, good question. We actually do that. Um, so where I said you, you uh, init the DB and then you commit it, what we actually do is we, we use the base image that um, we created, let's say, a couple of months ago. Then we have a series of updates that we run on that. Um, there was another question. That, that's how we update the database. Oh, and then we copy in the settings file, and then we commit it. And then that thing is the thing you start up every time, so it's ready. You, you could also use that initial thing, start it up every time, run the updates every time, but obviously that's not as effective. So we do everything at start, commit it, and use it. Yeah, good question. Anyone else? Yeah, um, I, yeah I said a question about, um, uh, like, have you looked into like other things like uh, fixtures, mocking, or some other kind of libraries, uh, like in, in, in your testing, instead of using like the actual Postgres database, and why, why have you gone like this way? We basically had to make a decision what would be the most, uh, the best return on investment, essentially. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning, we could have gone and tested every single component individually, and if you can do that, do that. But we went the way of this, where if, if as you can see right in the beginning, um, I don't know if, if you can see it, but what, what actually happens is we create an invoice, we post that invoice, and a lot of other things. And if that works, that covers a heck of a lot of code in the back end, actually. And if some developer did clean up or did a new feature and whatever, um, and accidentally changed something, chances are when you post an invoice, which is conceptually this much, but code-wise this much, you're going to touch it somewhere. And it's gonna, your test is gonna fail. And even though you might not know specifically where it failed, you know that something's wrong. And, and you can actually drill down quite specifically into where the failure is. So, so we chose this because it's the least effort for the most reward. Um, if you have a bigger team, definitely, definitely look at other things as well. Anyone else? Other questions? Okay, I guess that's it then. Thank you.